Hello and welcome to today's Atlantic Circle in Conversation events. Uh, we are delighted today to have Professor Joanna Price or Joe Price as our guest speaker of this event titled Global Challenges in Land Use. My name is Magda Joshi. I'm the Events and Alumni Engagement Manager in the Philanthropy Engagement and Partnerships team and will be delighted to be today's host. Today is the last event of uh, the Atlantic Circle in Conversation series in the academic cycle 2020-21. And uh, we are really excited for, for today's session. Before we begin, however, I just wanted to outline a few housekeeping issues. First of all, if you would like to please rename yourselves on Zoom so that we know your um, name and possibly your affiliation to the college. Uh, kindly remain on mute throughout the session's duration, uh, unless towards the end you would like to ask a question. We'll get to that part in the second half of today's in conversation. Uh, the event itself will run approximately 60 minutes. It is being recorded, so if you need to leave at any point, you will be able to revisit the event on our YouTube channel. And uh, I encourage you also to use the chat function to ask uh, any questions you may have for Joe. Uh, today's speaker is a qualified vet uh, who followed an academic career in biomedical and veterinary research and education. Since 2016, Joe has been vice chancellor of the Royal Agricultural University, a specialist land-based institution. Her current external appointments reflect her interest in education and the land-based industries. The focus of Joe's talk will be on land use, a finite commodity that, if appropriate, appropriately managed, is key to increasing biodiversity and tackling the major global challenges of food security and climate change. As part of the talk, Jo will also reflect on her career and how serendipity and values shaped by her time at UWC Atlantic have played a role in her decision making. Welcome Jo and I hand over to you for this exciting presentation. Thank you very much, Magda, for your introduction and welcome to everybody and thank you for joining. I, I'm not a football fan, but I gather the football is in at the moment, so it's lovely to see you all. So I will share my screen and I'll do that now so that I can um, sadly not see you, but let's try, let's do this one. And I'll put it on full screen. Is that okay? Can you see me all right, Magda? Is that fine? Excellent, thank you. So um, I'm going to start my talk with just a, some reflections on my career, as Magda mentioned, before I come to the main subject. It, I, I did find it quite intimidating after I'd given the title because it isn't my specialist subject. I've got more interested in it, obviously, have as becoming vice chancellor of a land-based institution. But, but when I was preparing the talk, I thought it, I would share with you the journey that I came on. And there are some interesting link-ups which I thought I'd share with you. Because as, as I get older, I think maybe that's something that happens when you get older. You do reflect and consider more the inevitability of pathways. And my father actually was, a student at the Royal Agricultural University. This is an image of the, of the university where I work now, which is in Gloucestershire, in a very beautiful part of the English countryside, which was founded in 1845 at, at the time of the first industrial revolution, as there was a mass movement of people uh, to the cities. And so there needed to be a revolutionary change in agriculture. And we, describe what's happening now in agricultural systems as another agricultural revolution. My father came here as an ex-serviceman after the war and because he always wanted to be a farmer, but he didn't come from a farming background, but he was able to get educated in agriculture. And his first job was to be an agricultural advisor in West Wales. And this is the little house that he and my mother lived in. And they rented some land on the coast of Pembrokeshire which if you've never visited is a very beautiful part of Wales. Now, we'll talk later a little bit about returning to more sustainable agricultural systems, 
but this was the sort of agricultural system my father was familiar with at the time, because at the time in Wales, the average size of the herds of cows was 13. And his job was to increase agricultural productivity. Basically, that's what he was given the brief to do in Pembrokeshire, because obviously there was a need to increase agricultural productivity after the war when the vulnerability of the food system became very apparent. This land was so poor that they were unable to make a living on it. And my mother insisted they moved a little bit in land. And this is actually where I was brought up. Now, I was desperate to escape from this small rural community. And that was one of the reasons why I applied for a scholarship from the local authority to go to Atlantic College. And I think it's something we should reflect on at the end that really it was something at the time that to do it, to, to stay in agriculture was not seen as having a proper career. So at the speech day in Fishguard, anyone who went to Oxford or Cambridge or to university was heralded as a success story. Those who stayed at home on the farm were not mentioned at all. And I think that that's one of the most interesting things that we are confronted with now is for the last 50 years, agricultural education has taken a back seat. Agricultural research, particularly in the UK, has been underfunded. And suddenly now we're confronted with the whole issue of what do we do about global food security? So I didn't want to, obviously didn't even think about studying agriculture because it wasn't, we didn't have a farm that was of any size, but I was a, a pony mad young girl. And so I determined that I wanted to be a vet. I'm still pony mad and this is me not that long ago, uh, still indulging my passion for horses. So my first job after leaving AC, as we, I can't help but call it that, was to go and work as a horse vet. And I worked for a gentleman who was the Queen's vet. And the reason there's a strange picture of culottes, which I thought I would share with you, is that I was the first woman that he had ever employed. And he, it was probably one of the grass seedings that I suppose that I have tackled in my career. And he insisted that I didn't wear trousers. That may seem slightly extraordinary to you now because he said he didn't think trousers were suitable clothes for a female vet to wear. So I had to wear culottes, which are a ridiculous form of apparel if you're trying to deal with horses. So I went to work for Peter, as I say, partly because I always could never resist a challenge. And I also was, as, as you've seen already, I had a fundamental interest in horses. Interestingly, my the president of our college is His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. And uh, I did remind him when I met him, when I came to this job, that I had once stitched up his polo pony. I didn't stay very long in private practice, but I did work in Singapore for a while. And I suppose we all learned that love of traveling at, at, at the college. And I, and I traveled in Southeast Asia, worked as a vet in the Far East, but I did return to academia when I was about 30 and, and studied for a PhD. I won't dwell on my career too, too much, but I have been privileged enough to work in biomedical and medical research. And my actual subject of expertise was bone. So that's why I hope you don't ask me too many technical questions when it comes to land use because for all of my academic career till I moved to the current position, I did have an active lab and we worked on how bone regenerates. I worked on an animal model of regeneration and how it responds to its mechanical environment with the main objective being to prevent diseases of bone fragility uh, in humans and in athletes. And mentioning football makes this uh, perhaps a bit more relevant. So that was what I did as part of the day job but obviously education was at the heart of my academic life. And I was, uh, for my sins, a professor of veterinary anatomy, spent a lot of my uh, academic career working with vet students. Um, and, and, I, and I think that is, uh, you know, as, as I say, the heart of my belief is that education can transform the way that we look at the world. Now, I was obviously in working with vet students, they were, you know, highly achieving students. And so it was a different sort of institution 
that I moved to when I came to uh, the, the Royal Agricultural University. And I'm going to come back now to the main theme of my talk. Uh, it's interesting. Everybody wants to be a vet in the UK, and, and I'm sure that's the same in the other countries that you come from, because it's seen as a prestigious career, rather like medicine. But it still is a challenge to encourage young people to think about agriculture. So let's start, if you don't mind, with some basic facts about land use, which some of you may know already, so apologies if it seems a little bit basic. But it always strikes me as a staggering statistic that globally only 1% of the world is built is the built environment. And of the habitable land, which is 71% of the land mass, the rest being mountains and deserts, about 50% of it is used for agriculture. So a significant amount of land is used for agriculture, the rest being forested. And so my focus of my talk is really going to be when we're thinking about land use as to how we are thinking about agricultural land use. So when you look at that in a different way and you sort of look at it in terms of sort of area of the globe, which is dedicated to different usages, you can see that in, it's a massive amount of the globe is dedicated to livestock production and that includes, it's not that there are animals on that area, but it includes the areas that are involved in crop production for feeding livestock, tiny area of the built up environment when you look at it globally. So it's really quite staggering statistics. And then it helps us really, I suppose, understand the impact of livestock production on climate change. And when looking at agricultural land usage, it's it's kind of intuitive anyway, but you can see that there are countries, parts of the globe, sorry, where and, and countries where there's very intensive agricultural land use. And it maps very closely to the maps of food security. So that's the pattern of global land use. And, and I thought it would be worth just showing some comparative figures for the UK, because the built environment, which is colored in pink in the UK, is, is the, the proportion of the, of the country that's the built environment in the UK is higher. And interestingly, only 10% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. And I'll come back to this um, sheep later on, but I wanted to show a picture of the Brecon beacons because I'm sure all of us have very, got very fond memories of uh, being cold and wet on the Brecon beacons whether or not we did the uh, chef rescue service or not from induction loop. So obviously the way we use land and, 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 and agricultural practice is absolutely critical to solving major global challenges. And the global security, food security, um, as, as we, we talk about all the time as a challenge, there's a map, there's an index of global food security. And if you look at this, it maps very closely onto what I showed you earlier. So the best performance in terms of global food security are highlighted in green and there are other areas where there's massive need for improvement. And of course, the pressure on global food security comes from the population growth, which is continuing to increase. So major global challenge is food security. And another universal truth is that agriculture and forestry activities are a major are the major drivers of biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradation. So I think, you know, if nothing else, that's something to always hold in our minds. And I talked about the 1950s and 60s. And if this, if we look here, you can see that the intensive agriculture systems that were put in place in the 60s in the UK and in other, you know, developed countries particularly, where there was a high input, removal of hedgerows, it was all about yield and it was all about producing more for less. And so with this, you have much lower biodiversity and deforestation is having a massive impact. And I'm sure I don't need to tell any of you about this because we're all aware of what's happening in the Amazon. So 24%, you know, it's a statistic, that is you know, so familiar to everyone, 
of global house gas emissions comes from agriculture, forestry and other land use. Globally, that is. And of this, this 24%, livestock contributes 40, 14 and to greenhouse gas emissions. So you know, these are really important statistics. Behind them lie some, 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 some slightly different stories. And of course, in this, as in as written by George Orwell, not all animals are equal. And so the amount of CO2 in terms of million tons equivalent produced from ruminants is very different from that produced from monogastric animals. And this map I thought was very interesting was that it shows the proportion of ruminant production in different parts of the world. I mean, and it's, you know, we understand that, you know, in Latin America, America, massive amount of ruminant agriculture taking place. But this is shifting in the proportion of ruminant farming taking place in Asia, South Asia is increasing as people get more of an appetite for eating red meat, it comes with affluency. So one of the key drivers of climate change is, is consumer trends and the way that consumer demand changes as countries become more affluent. And there's this, you know, this relationship between climate change and, and land usage. You know, it has been known for a long time, but I think that the climate change emergency, which has really been highlighted in recent years, you know, has brought it home to us much more. So, you know, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a circle because clearing land for soil production in the Amazon rainforest is often is one of the reasons why that then leads to the fires we've all seen on the, on the media. And a lot of this is around soil production. So soil production is required to feed different animals, which we use for our protein sources and of course, we saw on an earlier slide that the ruminants are actually causing a lot of damage, particularly those in intensive farming systems. I just wanted to show you this slide because I found it actually when I was looking for an image of climate change. And I wanted to show it because when I was a student at Bristol, I traveled to Kenya and visited Lake Naivasha and this picture is a recent picture that in the middle of COVID, climate change led to significant flooding of around the Lake Naivasha area. Now there are well-known tensions between agriculture and wildlife populations. We know this in terms of, you know, the habitats of pandas, the habitats of animals such as elephant. You know, it's, it's been something which has been the challenge of the World Wildlife Fund for so long, but the recent impact has been that hippos and crocodiles have been at killing people and in significant numbers in Kenya as a consequence of this climate change. And um, it, it's, it's, it was just something I thought should be highlighted because everything is so closely linked together. And it's, uh, and these poor community, poorer farming communities are challenged much more in any case. But I thought it would be worth highlighting, and it might be worth something that discussing later, is that when it comes to climate impact, this is something that I feel is not highlighted sufficiently, maybe because it's not necessarily something the politicians want to talk about, is that food systems differ when it comes to climate impact. So there is a big difference between the methane production of a ruminant in a feedlot system, feedlot system such as this one we see from the states, and we know that they are the same systems operate in Australia and in the in countries which are moving into ruminant production, compared to the methane production from ruminants which are raised entirely on pasture. So I keep my horse that I showed you a picture of earlier. So this goes back to circles on a, an, on a farm in Gloucestershire where there has been no arable production for 25 years. And the farmer is part of the pasture for life scheme. So none of his animals that are fed, uh, sorry, are used for beef production have ever been fed cereals. 
And the impact on biodiversity of this farming system is extraordinary. I mean, you absolutely, I should have taken pictures of his farm, but this is very similar to, to his farm in the number of different sort of wildlife, wildflower species that you see in, a, in, a, in an area of grassland is extraordinary. And obviously that has an effect on bees. And, you know, the, 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 so the, we have to think about it as in a more nuanced way. And someone who worked for me at Bristol has actually worked out methane equivalents per calorific density. And it's really different when you look at ruminant production in this way. And one has to also think about areas of the countryside Again, I'm going back to the Brecon beacons, cannot be used for growing crops. They cannot be used for food production for humans. And so it is a beneficial system, in my opinion, that we should have sheep on those mountains. Now, some would argue that you shouldn't have sheep on the Welsh mountains. And then one has to accept that you will have a very different landscape. And land is very important from tourist perspective, it, it feeds the rural economy. So the rural economy is much bigger than agriculture. And we know that in Gloucestershire, where we know that tourism is a massive source of income and, and our local authority have just begun to realize this. If you leave the land alone and you don't farm it, you will get natural woodland and scrub coming back. And this is actually an area of Massachusetts because you know, one forgets that Massachusetts used to be farmed and didn't look as it does now at all. So I don't want to be focusing on the problems. And so I will move on to thinking about some of the solutions. And um, I'm going to just give you, as I say, some snapshots around this. Clearly changing agricultural practice is important. And the one challenge facing changing practice is that the average age of many farmers is high. So the average age of farmers in the UK is well into their 50s. And I would suspect that's the case globally, but as more young people move away into the urban environments, technology is going to be critical. We need to support more R&D that has impact and relevance. And if you take the UK as an example, the problem has been that not only have all the agricultural research institutes been closed down, but there is very little patchy agricultural research taking place. So there's no one institute that is where government turns to, to understand what the problems are. And our research assessment systems in the Western world value research that is very, very knowledge driven and is published in high impact factor journals. So it doesn't necessarily help the industry that it serves. And I can talk about that later a little bit more if you wish. I think there has to be more of an interdisciplinary approach to the way we solve these problems and public private partnerships are going to be key with public private partnerships between universities so that we know the solutions that industry needs, as well as uh, actually when you're thinking about how to change agricultural, agriculture in different countries. We need to put diet at the heart of public health policy and land use implications need to be at the heart of the political agenda. So I will end with a couple of slides, I'm not quite there yet, which are a little bit detailed and I won't read to all of them, but they relate to a very recent paper which has been published about food systems use in the UK and which directions we could go in. And of course, there need to be better informed consumer choices. So the, I'm not going to go into the detail through these slides, but, but the solution the prime, at the heart of the problem is soil degradation. And that is going, you know, solutions to preventing soil degradation are absolutely critical. This is uh, showing erosion, soil degradation in Madagascar. I wanted to show a couple of slides from one of the academics at our institution who works on earthworms. So soil she defines as being the poor man's tropical rainforest. And it is staggering when you think that a quarter of all living species are in soil. There's a huge um, impact on soil organisms on soil quality. And 
I thought I'd just illustrate to you an image of soil compaction. So four million hectares of soil is at risk of compaction. And before I came to the Royal Agricultural University, I never even thought about it, but big tractors compact the soil and that impacts on productivity. Now, in some ways it's reassuring that, that agricultural engineers are designing tires already to reduce compaction. And this is part of the drive towards sustainable agriculture. Changing traditional practices can take a long time, but this drone image shows what it can do. This is a drone image of some plots of land at the university, which have been farmed in different ways for over 10 years. And the green strips are areas of crop which have been direct drilled, so they haven't been ploughed. So these are areas that have been ploughed. And the direct drill was actually invented by Jethro Tull. Now, some of you may have known that. I thought it was just a rock band, but it shows that this is one of the, I think, probably sort of disciplines where going back to traditional practices is as relevant today as it ever was when we think about farming practices. So that ploughing is not good for the soil. And yet we're all familiar with seeing in the developed world and the developed world ploughing as being standard practice. Another alternative, which is obviously quite topical, is rewilding. And this is the Nev estate. And actually uh, the owner of the estate is one of our alumni. And the approach that he's taking because he can, because he can take a very long-term view is to rewild the estate and land tax laws in the UK do enable land to be kept in, in genera across generations. Technology I mentioned earlier, and agrotechnology is attracting huge investment across the globe. Companies like Ocado are investing hugely in it. And it's not just about with different ways of growing tech, you know, our, our crops, which is in, based on technology. The number of applications which are available to farmers to help them improve productivity and understand their soils is, is absolutely growing exponentially. This is technology and farmers in Africa can communicate with farmers elsewhere and it's making a huge difference in terms of productivity. And you can mitigate. So again, this is work that we're involved with at the university and this is work around red seaweed. Sorry about the spelling. This is Pemba where this red seaweed is produced. And this particular kind of seaweed, it's not any kind of seaweed, by the way, will reduce methane emissions in cattle very significantly. But the seaweed production systems themselves raise many important questions about slavery and how it's produced. And it's, uh, I think I wanted to mention here that it's women in Pemba who harvest the seaweed because they go out into the shallow lagoons and harvest it. And, in, and there's increasing evidence that by empowering women, you are more likely to get novel diversified agricultural systems than if you only educate the men, because women are more likely to be innovative. And that's, I think, quite interesting. The other, the, of course, when you come to politics, I mean, the, there can be local political tactical solutions such as flood mitigation. I wanted to show you this flooding because it's actually in Gloucestershire as well. And of course, all this brown water is soil erosion. So those are things that can be done, I mean, by governments. But of course, we've got to start thinking about strategic political, political decision making. And I'll come to the end of my talk with, with, you know, I couldn't do it without actually highlighting the recent trade deal with Australia. And this, and Boris obviously was behind Brexit and the farmers voted for Brexit. And we're still in, in, at this massive change point in UK agriculture between going from a subsidized system, we're in a transition phase into, what, into a different system, which is going to be more focused around environmental land management schemes. And you know, some of you may have some thoughts on this, but of course, you know, it raises the question as does, does Britain need to produce any food? So this is a paper that I referred to, and I would encourage any of you to read it. And uh, because it's quite chilling in some ways, it's very recent and it's been produced by the Global Food Security Task Force, 
which has been established to look at different food systems. And I didn't want this to be too UK focused, but I thought it illustrated what is going to face governments anywhere. So they describe, this is all done by modelers, by the way. So they've created four different models for the UK food system, which they describe as carbon neutral, commercial, communal, or collaborative. And the, what they're all focusing on different political agreements in different ways. So the carbon neutral scenario, which is very much weighted towards the Paris Agreement, and as is scenario two, is where you really don't import much food. You boost low carbon technology, you mechanize food production, you increase unemployment as a consequence of doing that because you have a mechanized agricultural system. Food is quite expensive in this system. It's more expensive in any of the systems actually that you look at and mega farms dominate the landscape. And it's quite 1984 like and quite chilling, but it's deliberately designed to provoke because uh, disruption is what we need to start thinking about. The commercial model is that you actually replace land with forests and renewable energy farms. You uh, actually make sure that you meet your climate mitigation targets, but you're totally dependent on food imports. And I mean, Tony Blair, I think, was known to think that the U-shaped cage should just become a landscape for tourism. Supermarkets have to stockpile food because there may be uh, problems with trade agreements, and you've got increased rural deprivation. The rural economy really suffers. And the key thing about scenarios one and two is that biodiversity actually goes down. So carbon mitigation does not necessarily lead to biodiversity improvements. The communal system is basically a localized approach, which you see in many, you know, you might see in many developed countries, and it was much more the approach that was used where I grew up. But it's going to be quite challenging because, but it has got its advantages. So it's, but there has to be redistribution of land and wealth back to smaller farms, and that's probably not likely to happen. So the scenario that we would all probably like to have is a collaborative food system with a global approach where global governance controls full production systems. This probably is, you know, um, a pie in the sky. And probably some of you will say this can't be achieved, but it has a wider sustainability focus. But the UK would be primarily exporting red meat as a luxury product, but our diet would then change. So it's more plant-based with more, more white meat. Technology enables a global carbon food system. So whichever one of those scenarios or whichever shade of scenario you adopt as a, as, as, as a country, you know, we need transformative global change. I mean, there has to be a move towards dietary change. There have to be strategies for tackling food waste. We would all want a biodiversity enhancing food production system. And, you know, we need to meet obviously the Paris agreements and the broader SDGs, but clearly they're going to have to be national strategies based on trade. I had started with education and I need to come back to education. Uh, and I might disagree with Tony Blair on many of his policies, but I think that the key thing around improving the way we think about, so improving land usage in the sense that we, we improve biodiversity and have a positive impact on climate change is through education. And this can be education at an undergraduate level, so attracting different types of students into thinking about studying the agricultural, thinking about careers in, in agriculture or, or the land-based subjects. It's also about improving our thinking around how to eat healthily. And it's also around adult education. But linking to my point earlier about educating women, this is a, an agriculture, an adult school for adult farmers, but they are all men. And we had a group of Angolan farmers come to the college and there were no women amongst it. So it raises all sorts of interesting issues. But agriculture, as you've seen from my talk, is very scientifically based. So let's end. I'm sorry, I've probably gone on far too long and I'll get told off. But it was I wanted to just end with the UWC because what we what I've tried to do since I've been at the university that I'm current had the privilege of being at for the last five years is to base our future on global partnerships. 
and we've developed a number of partnerships with institutions globally. We have had already done that for a long time. We'd educated farmers from all over the world, a lot of farmers from sub-Saharan Africa, because obviously it's sharing our way of thinking about the way we solve the problems of food production as, as, as a global uh, collaboration has got to be the way forward. So thank you very much for listening and I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, there's a lot of questions. So um, thank you very much for those and um, happy to take them. So thank you. So. Thank you very much, Joe, for this fantastic presentation. We've had a lot of really, really good comments on the chat, as, as you, you will see. Um, and we'll turn to the discussion first, but I just wanted to, to command you on, uh, compliment you on uh, covering in the span of the past half an hour, not only land use, but also, of course, agriculture, uh, the topics of, of education, of uh, even politics, uh, of geography, uh, and even fashion. So, uh, so that, that's fantastic. Thank you for that's taking okay. us on, on this journey. Um, to begin with, I'll uh, be I'll start with a question from uh, from Kai, who uh, complimented you firstly on on a great presentation. Uh, Kai says that uh, uh, I work in chemical industry, and we in the very near future uh, will be in a massive need of renewable energies and bio based materials instead of ethylene, for example, all related to the intensive use of land. Wouldn't it make sense to define land areas globally for dedicated use and for untouched natural development only? Well, the answer, I think, I've hopefully I touched on that uh, towards the end of my talk, because, yes, I think absolutely. I think there needs to be a global approach to land use, essentially, and there need to be global agreements over land use. Otherwise, you do run into these terrible problems that we're seeing in South America at the moment. And there is information available from looking at the food security indexes and how climate change affects, is going to affect the world as to how we could make those decisions. So um, your ans the answer is yes, how to achieve it, I think will be more challenging, but I think it will require some global agreements around land use actually, uh, which is, oh, uh, you know, at the moment it's all tucked under the Paris Agreement and SDGs. I don't know whether that would um, answer the question. Thank you, Joel. Uh, we, uh, we've had another uh, question from my colleague, Keith. Keith, would you uh, like to ask your question directly? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, brilliant talk, Joe. thanks a lot. Um, I guess you, you mentioned changing agricultural systems as a possible solution in terms of sort of output and sort of productivity. I mean, will it be sufficient with to, I guess, cover sort of the growing population as well as um, you, you mentioned, I think you sort of touched on it towards the end, especially with scenario four. Um, but, but what are your thoughts on changing the agricultural systems that people use versus changing I guess, consumer demand and mentality, such as the dietary requirements that you, well, the dietary desires um, as being, I guess, a more, I guess, which one is probably more to focus on to initially at least? I think we've got to, I don't think, I think, I think it's not one or the other. I think that they're, they're, they're all so closely interlinked. I think, you know, unfortunately, people have got very used to cheap food, and that's a really hard one to crack, I think, particularly in developed countries. I think we have got opportunities through young people and through the, I think in some ways, and I forgot to mention that the climate change can be a solution because I think climate change has highlighted to the younger generations this whole issue of what they eat and don't eat and COVID to some extent. If you look at what's been positive about the disruption of COVID is maybe people think about this more. So I think we have to just work more and I, I touched on some of them, but is on essentially sustainable agricultural practices. And intensive agriculture is not at the other end of regenerative agriculture. They're all, sustainable agriculture can be achieved with high yields. 
it just requires significant education. I mean, in, in the USA, they've actually, productivity's gone up. And in countries like Holland, agriculture productivity's gone up. There are some countries that are very good at doing it. I mean, the UK has been very bad at doing it because it hasn't invested in the long-term view. So it takes a very long-term view and the, you know, and, and adoption, as I say, of sustainable practices. And there's no one size fits all. I think some areas of land like Lincolnshire in this country and parts of the Midwest, they need to be producing lots of food. And if they're doing that, they've got to produce it in a sustainable way as possible. We've got to feed everybody. You know, the scenario of when you've got people sort of living off food banks has got to stop, hasn't it? And part of the UK's sort of leveling up agenda needs to think about these issues. I mean, you know, because because I think I think it, as I'm answering our question badly, but I think it's it's a dual pronged approach, isn't it? It's it's got to be about the sort of harnessing the interest in climate change, but it's also got to be back to one of the questions in the chat is absolutely trying to get better understanding that it's not simply that all cows are bad and you know we we mustn't have them because we can still have varied diets it just has to be that we think about where those animals are produced i think but at the moment there's a very nervous approach taken by say the the farmers union in the uk to this whole issue of if they, this, they have to be schizophrenic about food, the way they, about food production, because they don't want to really talk about this too much. And somebody did ask the question about the academic research. I think it was Sven. Um, and, and I can certainly, if you email me, there are definitely a number of publications around the, uh, the impact of of different, uh, uh, sorry, the different ruminant production systems and the and and the, and the impacts, and I think that they're going to hopefully get more more visibility. That was. Thank you, Thank you very much, Joe. I've also had a follow up question with Sven uh, as well. He would like to know what you think about the roundtable of responsible soybean initiative. Yeah, well, I, I don't know a huge amount about it because I haven't followed it in, in a lot of detail. But I mean, anything where people get together and actually start tackling this issue of how to produce a more sustainable production system, whether it's for soya beans or anything else, it's got to be the right way forward. And I think the other thing I didn't mention, just because I didn't have time, was the whole issue of of, of genetic modification of food as well. Because I think when I use technology, I was remiss in not adding that in because genetic transformation of food can have a huge impact on food security, but it's a political hot potato as well. But I'm very happy for someone to come back at me and discuss it. So I don't know if you want to do that. Hi, Jan. Thank you. Um, Jan, I think you have a question. Hello, Would Joe. You... Hello, Hi, how are you? Oh. <laughs> Good to see you. You've frozen, I think. Yeah, great. Hi, Joe, the same from 44 years. You hear me? Yeah. No. Yeah, you're breaking up a bit. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm far away. But my question, Joe, is the following: um, Looking, at how can we um, get the general public? It's a very difficult question, easy to ask, difficult to answer. Uh, to change their behavior, you touched upon it. And my example, which I'd like to give, is uh, education is obviously vital. But the example Ronaldo gave in the uh, presentation of the European Championships just two days ago, he put away the Coca-Cola bottles and he took a bottle of water in front of him. That kind of effect of a guy like him, an impressive person for uh, soccer lovers and sport lovers, it has a great impact on change of behavior. Can you elaborate on that? You, you seem to agree. I'm happy you agree with me. But what is your view about how we can get the general public to change their behavior in order to make that food change? 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, I was thinking, I need, I was going to mention it again. You know, those anybody who's watched Top Gear in the UK with Jeremy Clarkson is now taken up farming. Well, you need to have ambas- you need to have champions and influencers. They are absolutely critical. And and if you in the UK, you know, healthy school meals or providing school meals so it influenced politicians. The fact that a footballer did it. So you know, and I think it's just. The, the the interest in the land and and we're seeing it in the uk that more people are buying land or moving back to the countryside post covid interestingly because i think that that's made them think about the sorts of lives they want to lead that has got to be a positive change so it's going to be as i say bringing back that focus but also as you say having key influencers because politicians listen to influencers they don't necessarily listen to the science and that's the problem and it's getting around because that you know none of this is new i mean i looked up a few papers about you know the impact of climate change on agriculture this has been out there for a very long time it's just as you rightly say, it's like the, the the blue planet. It makes a big difference, and and albatrosses, you know, swallowing fishing lines will have an impact on young people in China, which maybe they, ha- you know, is it, it, going to take, you know, uh, getting through the way that we look after animals, for example, which is obviously, but is is really critical. But there's a dichotomy sometimes between the way people think about the planet. This is a long answer. And the way they think about their food systems at home, because if you think about the food systems that are happening in those countries where, you know, animals are still produced in very unenvironmentally friendly ways, it, it, it's, it's getting that synchrony between the two things, I think. But you're absolutely right. I don't know what others think, but I think there is a renewed focus back on 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 the on the rural economy there's more funding going back into the rural economy that's definitely happened in europe so you know people want to move away from having devastated rural economies and i think that's certainly true in in the developing countries as well is and and the one thing i should have talked about was that the digital infrastructure change that we've been catapulted into because of covid is enable people you know, to, to, to work very differently in those ways and actually run their businesses in the middle of the countryside. And that will mean that people will start thinking about those issues again. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Sorry, there's a lot of questions. I'm being Thank you. David, in your question, you somewhat uh, touched upon uh, upon uh, some of these uh, issues. I was just wondering if you, if you still wanted to ask your question, uh, David Kay from Class of 72. Or if you you've already had answers to your question, well, I'd be interested if Joe had. It's really a question about scale and and local versus global. I'll mention in passing, I'm a faculty member at Cornell University. I'm I'm working right now on actually conflicts between growing conflict as we transition off of a carbon economy in our state to uh, conflicts between land use conflicts between farmers who are ambivalent about uh, large scale solar and solar development. There's a, it's a very interesting issue. But what I was asking about, and this is really about the trend in the United States, and I'm a little curious about your perspective in other countries to relocalizing food systems. Um, I would call it a movement. It's not really quantitatively huge, but part of that I think is because the price of energy has stayed so low that it's still very cheap to move, to move uh, fuel, you know, to move fuel around, cultural you know. products around. So I'm just wondering if you have a perspective on kind of relocalization and what its implications could be for, for uh, the food system, you know, localization, what's its implications globally is really the question. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that scenario we I showed at the end. And I think, you know, I could describe the same as happening in this local region here. You know, there's tensions between farmers who are, well, our farmers are in a kind of denial state at the moment as to what they're going to do post-Brexit. And the, you know, then, you know, yours might be more advanced. There's the, there's the, the, the those who don't want to have solar systems as, there's all of these local tensions going on because there are those who want the environment, the, the landscapes to look as they do. They don't want a solar farm in the, the, the planners block things. So it's all complicated actually, isn't it? So the local 
food strategy, you know, we're trying to write one for Gloucestershire with multiple stakeholders. Does that make sense? So that you can develop a shorter food supply chain for Gloucestershire. That is working quite well because bringing all the stakeholders together is really helping, I think, bring about better understanding. So if you bring the planners, the farmers and the, the local sort of public health people together to have those debates, we're finding that's being quite powerful does you know as, as a mechanism to do that because i'm sure that you know that you'd agree that that you've got to have multiple stakeholder engagement in all of this and that's been the problem i think and for those of us who've been academics there's always been this sort of well we've got this knowledge over here but farmers are not going to necessarily adapt that knowledge if they don't think it's going to hit their bottom line do they i mean and that's the way it works and as you say then you've got people in the middle who care deeply and they have what you can sometimes call soapbox agendas. So it's, it, it, you know, it is a, it's, I'm, I'm not answering your question very well, but I think we as you academics can actually be catalysts for those discussions sometimes. And that's becoming much more of a focus in the UK that what is the role of the university in, in enabling these debates? You put your thumb up, is that okay? That's good because that's what we do. That's what we try and do. So. Yeah, and I mean, and we've got a group who have done a lot on farmer-led innovation. I mean, and I think that that's that's going to make a lot of difference if you can do that. I think as well. So thank you. So long question, long answer to a good question. Thank you. We've had a question from Kelly, who is curious if people moving back to to the land uh, is resulting in an increase in use of land for residential purposes. Her village in Bavaria has the same population as in 1930, but takes up twice the amount of built space. Yeah, and, and as I say, I'm going to answer this without much information behind me, but, but, but the problem is, is the way families are constructed now. So you're absolutely right. I think the evidence is that you can have the same population need more more built space because often people live in single household units and so i think that's one of the key factors i mean you don't have multiple household units in rural communities my view on this is a little bit sort of maybe um wouldn't go down very well with our local community but there's such a large amount of land that is not used in as part of the built you know it, it, i don't see it as being a major problem if you look at the global statistics and even the uk statistics i think there is massive opportunity for you know being able to actually build more housing but it, the problem is it's got to be done as we talked about before with thinking about schools and infrastructure and medical facilities and all those other things as well if you get it right you don't get the resentment of of having those rural communities and you, and and i think there's got to be uh also uh what people will support rural regeneration when it increases productivity and you know that people actually benefit from it i think having older retirement housing on the outskirts of rural visit villages isn't necessarily the right answer either um, thank you um we have one uh, last question uh, before we conclude this event, and that's uh, turning towards uh, the, the pandemic, the current rea reality that we find ourselves in. And uh, the, um, the question is around the impact of, of COVID, especially on how people uh, diet and on their health altogether. So what has COVID uh, done on the, to the way people think about dieting and health? I think, again, it goes back to what we touched on earlier. I think it depends on your how educated you are and which part of society you you occupy, for want of a better word, because I think that um, it's become increasingly clear that poor health and particularly being overweight will have an impact on your ability to resist COVID. So I think it has brought into focus the need for there to be better diets for us to have better body mass indexes and our ability to resist disease but it's quite a difficult uh subject to approach i think isn't it and of course 
I think it's impossible to approach it because a lot of it is relating to, to poverty because often people may be suffering from poor health and poor housing, which is why you're more vulnerable to COVID. So I think it's probably had an impact in certain tiers of society, but I think it, it, it not, not, not across the board. Thank you very much. Um, I've got my email in the chat. So if anybody wants to follow it up, it'd be great to see you again and uh, talk about these things. It's sorry, it was a, I talked a little bit too long, but I just gave myself too big a subject. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's indeed a fascinating topic. And I uh, just looking at the chat, I, I can see that it's generated a lot of uh, not only questions, but also uh, points of reflection and comments on, on the society and on where we are. So um, thank you very much for this insightful talk. We are very grateful for your contribution to UWC Atlantic and, Atlantic and to our uh, series, Atlantic Circle in Conversation. It's great to have you as our guest today. Uh, thank you also to everyone uh, who joined us today. We hope you enjoyed this event and we hope uh, to see you uh, next year again when we resume this uh, series from um, autumn 2021. In the meantime, if you have any comments or suggestions on the series, my colleague Keith has just posted the link to our online feedback form. We would be grateful for your comments and thoughts. Uh, next week, uh, we will be hosting an event of a different series called In Touch, which provides unravels information on the college and on the movement altogether. Uh, so uh, we will be uh, sending more information by email uh, later today, and we hope that you will join us for this In Touch event. Once again, thank you very much, Joe, for this uh, great talk. And thank you, everyone, for joining Not us. Not at all. It was, a, it was a great pleasure. And I learned a lot doing it, which is also really important. So lovely to see everybody. Bye bye.